I'm very, very pleased to be able to introduce uh, Ilka Schmidlinski this evening. Ilka and I go back a long way. Um, I had known her since she was a student and later we were colleagues um, at the FTSK in Jammersheim, where we were both in the British Studies Department. Um, Ilka studied French and English while she was a student and uh, we, she was a very um, reliable colleague, someone who was very easy to get along with. So thanks for that, Ilka. Um, tonight, she's going to talk about her PhD thesis, recently published, and uh, since it's been recently held up, I won't do it again, but uh, it's called Scotland's A Sense of Change, History and the Land in Lewis Grassic Gibbons, A Scots Square, and James Robertson's And the Land Lay Still. Um, in this, uh, Ilka explores Scottish identities, constructions and enactments of Scottish identities, and looks specifically at the very important role played by literature in filling in some of the gaps in Scottish um, identity that have been created by the uh, fact that Scotland is a, a stateless nation. So she looks at these two works in particular, and uh, yeah, we look forward to hearing you. So I will stop talking now. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I hope this works and you can now see the presentation. Um, I can't see you anymore, so if someone could let me know if the sharing has worked, that would be Can great. everybody else please switch off the camera? Um, Thank you. There we go. So you should be able to see the presentation now, I hope. Yes, we can. Go. Okay, perfect. Um, so as Ron said, um, this is my PhD topic, and as such, I cut it down somewhat for this talk to be able to give you a sense of what I did in my PhD. But because it's um, a rather long work, I don't. I'm not able to go into all of the details. So I'm going to um, talk mostly about history in a Scott Square and, and the land lay still and leave the dimension of the land out of this because to me um, the history aspect is the one that is more easy to grasp and um, better to present in such a sh short format and also for me personally admittedly the more interesting factor in this. So, Sorry um, can we just interrupt you for a second uh, we still have somebody uh, switched on their camera uh, that's good for the recording if you don't. Thank you. Should I leave mine on? Yes, please. Thank you. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, good. Um, yes. Yeah, so what I want to start with, what I started the book with and what I've also used in the title is, okay, if it doesn't want to go, um, this way, um, is the poem Speaking of Scotland by Maurice Lindsay that the line Scotland's a sense of change comes from. So I just want to put this poem up front and then I will come back to it periodically over what I'm talking about. So um, Maurice Lindsay writes, um, what do you mean when you speak of Scotland? The grey defeats that are dead and gone? Behind the legends each generation savors yet can't live on? Inheritance of guilt that our country has never stood where we feel she should. A nagging threat of unfinished struggle, somehow forever lost in the blood. Scotland's a sense of change, an endless becoming for which there was never a kind of wholeness or ultimate category. Scotland's an attitude of mind. And this, um, this last sentence, Scotland's an attitude of mind, is really what I'm going to be focusing on here when we talk about identity and Scottish identity. It's um, the aspect I focus on is that this is something that is created and that um, every Scot and every person speaking about Scotland, writing about Scotland and making films about Scotland is creating every day and in everything they do. So. Um, and that is basically the the core of um, my understanding of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, 
I will just briefly outline what my research question was going into this PhD. And we will then at the end come back to those questions and kind of see where I land on them, if I find I can answer them, or if they're actually questions that um, aren't answerable in such an easy way as I at the outset posited them. Then I want to talk more in depth about national identity. What I mean by that, how national identity is constructed and the role that literature plays in that. And then I'm going to introduce why these two texts and not any of the others I could have chosen. And then for the more in-depth analysis, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the narrative structures and how those structures help present the history that is um, involved or that is embedded in these novels. And the narrative structures um, also shape the way that um, the identity that the novels present is um, given to us. So I'm going to be talking a lot about narrative structures and giving you um, quotes from the books that show how these structures work. And then in my fifth point, I'm going to kind of get to a synthesis of what these narrative structures combined with the events that are shown in the books tell us about where these works stand on Scottish identity. Um, first off, my beginning point for this research, um, that was back in 2013, so it's been quite a while now and the project has changed in this in, in the intervening decade, but um, at this point in 2013, what we were looking at or what we were discussing among our colleagues is that a year before the independence referendum, looking back on the last century of Scottish history, how much Scotland's position within the UK had changed through devolution on the political side, but also in a way um, mentally and where Scottish identity and identity politics stood at the beginning of the 21st century in comparison with the 20th century. So what um, my questions were going into this is, can this political change that happened over the course of a century, can that be seen in the Scottish identity itself in how this identity is presented and, and how Scots perceive themselves and who they perceive themselves as being. And then also maybe um, there aren't so many changes in the identity. So um, the question of, or is it really, really a stable identity that has just now gotten a different weight on the political stage, let's put it that way. So those were the questions I went into my PhD with kind of looking at how does this history, these hundred years of, or a little more than a hundred years of history um, influence or how are they um, shown or um, have can be traced in identity. In doing so, what I have as fundamentals is the understanding of a nation as an imagined political community. So not something that is fixed, but something that is something that the members of the community have to agree on and have to live in their everyday life. So the question of nation states then also as it's not, the, the borders aren't given, they're not there if we look at any given map or if we look at satellite images of, of the earth, but that we make these political communities and we come together as nations and what we do to form a nation is that we, the members of the community, feel as if we belong together, as if we are a community, and that then makes the community. So we have this um, aspect of constructedness in the nation itself. Um, this goes back to Benedict Anderson, who in 1980s Three published his, first published his book, Imagine Communities, Reflections on the Origin and Spread of Nationalism, and brought this thinking prominently into the discourse. The um, page numbers I'm citing here are from the 2016 edition, but I have um, every edition I used listed in my sources at the end of the presentation. So if some of the pages don't match up with your copy, 
I'm probably using a different one. Um, and then this the same idea that Anderson gives is also um, an idea that already a hundred years prior, the um, French historian Ernest Renan talked about in his talk, Qu'est-ce qu'une nation, at the Sorbonne University in Paris, where he um, stresses that this community aspect, the nation, is built on the consent of its people, that the, the people have to express the desire to continue living in a common community, that they have to want to continue a common life. So we have the idea here that's really the people that have to be convinced. It's not something that can happen purely on a level of state institutions, but without the people, it's it may be a state, but it's not a nation. Which also then leads on to the point that communities like Scotland that hasn't had a nation state or a state of its own can very well be a nation because the nation is not necessarily linked to a state organization. So what we have in Scotland is what's termed um, a stateless nation, a nation that is very much identified as a nation, but exists in a broader state um, organization that does not reflect the nation's borders or the nation in, as it's as a whole. Um, with this as a basis, what we then get to is that the national identities that go along with these nations, these imagined communities, are of course also in a way imagined and constructed. So a na national identity is not something we can find somewhere get down to the nitty gritty of it and find all of it there laid out, I don't know, in our genes or in whatever, but that um, the national identities is also something that is constructed by the community, possibly aided or in other cases con um, obstructed by the state institutions. But what we have to, uh, or what we come back to is it's the people that have to be convinced. So um, national identities are made up of the stories that the communities tell about themselves, who they are, what their history is, where they live, how they live. All of these aspects then come together to form a picture of who a community, a nation is and who they um, think they are and who they want to be, especially when it comes to history. Um, here we go back to Renan also. Um, the focus is on what is remembered in the stories the community tells about itself, but also in what is not remembered. Um, so for example, for Renan, because he was a French historian, the example he cites that really embodies this is French national identity is built on a lot of things, but the story that is most often not included in that is the um, the crusade that saw the Northern French actually invade their own Southern brethren and um, kill them because they had a different a religion, different beliefs. So this, I think it was the fourth crusade, Renan says is, it would be really detrimental to a, an overall French identity if that was celebrated over and over and over again as something positive in the culture. So on the one hand, um, the stories that keep getting told and that keep repeated are what hold the nation together, but sometimes it's what is forgotten that helps hold the nation together and hold the community together. Because if certain things were focused on, then um, this community would likely break apart because there is too much tension in certain stories. And I think every community, every area, every nation has those points in its history where um, the borders weren't drawn, were drawn differently, where the communities didn't work in the same way or did not have the same shape as they have today. Um, what we come uh, to with that is also that identities are necessarily changeable as the communities change, as their situation changes, um, identities can also shift and um, 
change alongside that. So just as there is no stable nation that we can find somewhere out in the geography of the earth, there is also no stable identity that we can point to and say, it's always been like this, it will always be like this. But um, their um, identities change, the stories we tell change as we ha face new situations and as we make new experiences on a personal level, just as they do on a national, on a national identity level. With that, we've already talked a little about history and identity. Um, what I want to come to here also, because we're going to get back to this also when we talk about and the land lay still in particular is that history itself is also rather problematic because what really is history? No one writing history was really there and no one writing history can present the entire truth because as soon as we present history, we choose. So every act of history writing is making choices about what to include, how to talk about these things, which things to exclude, how to um, talk about causalities that might be perceived from today but that we cannot know for sure um, were really the way we think we know them to be so we don't have direct access what we do is we create narratives and interpretations out of what we have so history itself itself is not as objective as we would sometimes like to present it as so even when we have um, history, we cannot say for sure this is the way it was, but we always have accounts shaped by the people who tell them or by the period they live in and tell them from, so their contexts matter. And then we go one step further and tell stories of that history as part of identity. So it becomes even murkier in terms of truth if you want this concept. So um, what I'm arguing mostly is that there is no truth here, but it's interpretations and what is important or what um, I looked at a lot in my work is always who tells this story and what perspective is it told from? Because every teller tells a different story and every teller has a slightly different perspective or a vastly different perspective. So um, we'll come back to this question, who is telling the story and whose perspective are we in again and again when we get into the novels I looked at. And I wanted to put this here up front already when we talk about history that um, there is always this relativity that we work with. And lastly, before we leave the theoretical basis I worked from behind um, is the question of national identity and literature. So we have this community that has a common identity or that wants to be a community and create a common identity. And with the most of these national communities today, we can quite easily say, um, the identity doesn't spread by word of mouth. We need some type of medium to carry it. Um, in very, very small communities, it might be possible to know every member of this community. But even if you have a city state, it's too many people to know and feel as if you're part of the same community with all of them. So what we need is representations of this identity. We need a medium to carry the identity and to um, help disseminate it. So a central role is played here. Um, this was also a part of Benedict Anderson's argument by news media, by newspapers, who allowed when the printing presses came and when news and um, news media became more and more cheap, allowed a lot of people to have access to the same stories. Because before that, 
someone sitting in um, Glasgow would not necessarily have the same news stories in front of them every day as someone in Edinburgh. They the lives were much more provincial both or in, and self-contained before we had these media. Another another role played here, though, um, especially today, is um, the internet, is films, is social media. But there is still a place here also for literature to play its role. Maybe it had a bigger role 200 years ago, 100 years ago, before a lot of the other media took so much of center stage and when a lot more people were reading. But then again, back then we have higher and um, higher numbers of people who can't even read. So. Um, maybe the novel never had a much bigger standing than it has now when sometimes it feels like a small handful of people read and everyone else is just constantly on social media. But when novels have that um, newspapers, for example, don't, is they're much more long lived. No one would read the newspaper from two weeks ago, Wednesday. Why Why should they? We've moved on. We would read today's newspaper, maybe yesterday's, but that's the extent of it. But with a novel, we do still read novels written hundreds of years ago, written 10 years, 50 years ago. So the novel has a kind of longevity that other media don't have. And with the um, length of most novels, you also have a more um, a more a, a deeper identity that you can transport. Um, even with fiction, which we are talking here mostly about, what we have in the novels in 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 books is in a way rooted in our world. So even if we have completely fictional accounts, even if we have for example, let's say a, a science fiction or a fantasy novel, something in there is connected to our world. So um, this is a concept that's been talked about a lot that that's called mimesis. And I have two authors cited here on my slide that I used a lot when getting to grips with this concept and how um, literary works of all kinds are rooted back in in reality and in the author's um, experiences and perceptions. So really what the concept stands for is that um, no literary work is ever created in a vacuum. No author just s leaves his own life, his own personality, his knowledge at the door when he sits down to write. So even if the text they write may not be in any way related to their to their everyday life, the things they they believe or they know things about how people interact, how time works, that's a Paul Ricoeur's big topic. The um, work structures, life structures, they, sur they are surrounded by an everyday life, influences the way they work, even if the novels they then write don't have to faithfully reflect everything of their lives. They don't even have to be realistic, but there will be elements in there that are clearly connected back to the lives they lead to the societies they live in, even if these are questioning the societies. And then on the other side, we have the reader reading this work of fiction, this novel, and also the reader too doesn't leave all of his knowledge, all of his ideas out of the reading experience, but he comes to the novel as a fully formed person and as such reads the work and maybe integrates something into his worldview or reads something that um, questions something he believes to be true. And, and then this questioning or the, on the other hand, if he is, um, if his ideas match the author's, this reinforcement um, leads to 
him or her coming away from the novel still thinking about it and maybe integrating it into their lives or maybe talking to someone else about it. So no novel happens in a vacuum. We have authors' contexts influencing them, and then we have the novels influencing the readers and their own contexts. So this is basically where I come from when I say, OK, I want to look at how Scottish identity changed over the 20th century. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at literature. I'm not looking at news media. I'm not looking at diaries. I'm looking at novels. Because novels are representations or are connected to the lives of their authors and to our world so we can also look at them as products presenting this world. And for this specific thesis, I've chosen two works of realistic fiction. On the one hand, we have the trilogy A Scott Square by Lewis Gressick Gibbon, published between 1932 and 1934. Um, the trilogy is made up of the novels Sunset Song, Cloud Howe, and Grey Granite. This um, story it tells spans roughly the years 1911 to 1933, or right up until Grey Granite was published. So we're coming um, right into the very present moment of the author with the last book. And then we're looking at And the Land Lay Still, which is a standalone novel published in 2010 with a story spanning from the 1950s to 2008. And I think what you can see here is, um, I said in the beginning, I'm looking at the 20th century and Scotland's changing history. And the works I chose reflect that. We have a novel looking at 20 years at the beginning of the 20th century, and we have another looking at the last 50 years of the 20th century. Both of them works of realistic fiction set in Scotland. So um, we can safely assume they do tell us something about Scotland in the time they their stories cover. And taken together, they cover most of the big changes in the 20th century. And what I looked at was, what did they cover and how did they cover it? So we have a slight gap in between 33 and the 50s, but some of the characters in And the Land Lay still do have, of course, history prior to the 1950s. And we do get some storylines more than others that are very much also concerned with World War II and its effects on Scotland and on Scottish soldiers. So the gap gets very small in the middle of my time period. A major difference between the two works in terms of story structures is that Scott Square mainly tells the story of one character, Chris Guthrie, and later her son Ewan. While And the Land Lay Still tells the stories of a host of different characters, I've picked just four of the most important ones to put on this slide, but there is at least four more that are equally important and another 10 that we do get perspectives from and that are very important to the, the breadth of the image of life in Scotland we get. So um, on the one hand, we have a very focused story of one life. And on the other hand, we have a plethora of characters. And we will come back to this point in the end when I kind of come back to um, the way the history of Scotland is presented in both books. Chris or Ewan as main characters are also the main focalization characters of A Scott Square. But we do have other sections here. Um, we have a communal voice that is termed the speak that is that appears in various forms over the three novels of the trilogy, but that always comments on what is going on in the story, on what is going on in Chris's life. So it starts as being a kind of gossipy village voice that goes through, uh, did you hear what happened to Chris or to Chris's parents? and ends up being a somewhat more fragmented 
voice, but we do get outside perspectives um, on Chris's life and on the events in her life. And then there's prologues that are told from the narrator's uh, voice. I'm going through these rather quickly right now, but I have um, examples of all of them and I'll dig more into what these different voices do for the presentation of history in the books in a moment. This is just a brief overview. Um, and, and the land lay still, we also have a narrator that is very prominent in certain sections. And then we have a lot of different focalization characters. So we switch point of views a lot. And through that, get a lot of very different perspectives on what's going on. That as a brief overview. And now I want to go through each of these narrative voices in a little more detail. OK, no, sorry. Um, I had another slide here that I wanted to get to why these novels. So as I said on the previous slide, I do have them almost covering the entire century. So that is one point. Um, they do depict what I wanted to look at. On the other hand, they're, all, they're also both panoramic novels. So novels that try to give an inclusive picture of what they present and in this case life in Scotland. So on the one hand with Chris and with Chris Gustry's story, we will see that it moves through major phases in Scottish history in a way. We have important topics of Scottish life. We have important moments um, depicted there. And with and the Landlay still, it becomes even more clear that we're really trying to get the entire spectrum of life in Scotland in these novels. Um, I've put here historical novels question mark because I would question if they really both count as such. A Scott Square in particular, if we look at Grey Granite, which is set in the early 30s and was um, published in 1934, I don't think we can call that a historical novel. From today's perspective, of course, everything we read in there is historical to us, but it wasn't historical to Lewis Gressick Gibbon. So I think here it's rather clear that historical novel is not might not be the right label and the land lay still is the more difficult case because what it comes down to here is we really have to um, question where does history begin of course taken from 2010 in the 1950s yes um, there 60 years ago is 60 years ago um, history Walter Scott would say yes, because um, of course we, we do have exactly the same time span here that Waverly has to 60 years since. Um, but again, here we move up into the author's present and we very quickly move into decades that the author clearly lived himself. So a lot of, and the land lay still is more memory than it is history. So I'd like to keep the question mark here, even if um, and the land lay still may be shelved among historical novels. We have this in between case of a book that is partly set in the past, but then moves up to the present moment. So um, yeah, a little bit of discussion possible here. Both books were successful in their way and especially um, Sunset Song is still very apparently very popular book in Scotland. I'm not Scottish and I haven't done an, my own um, survey of Scots to figure out if they've really all read that, but it consistently comes in as the best Scottish book of all time or Scotland's favorite novels in different surveys. So there has to be something in that book that makes it popular because even if everyone would be forced to read it in school, I don't think very many people pick novels they hated in school as their best book if they're asked in such a survey. So Sunset Song 
very pr um, popular still. So we can expect it also to still have a lasting impression on the Scottish psyche and the picture of Scottish identity presented there should still be relevant because it's still being presented to new readers or old re old readers coming back to the book over and over. And the Lendley still doesn't have this um, vote of confidence that Sunset Song has with all of the surveys, but it, it was a very successful book. It, it got awards when it was published. So I felt um, justified in putting these two books side by side and looking at them as not only presenting life in Scotland in the period I was looking at, but as also um, having an influence and an impact on how Scots see themselves. And now we are getting to the different um, voices that present the story and the history in the two texts. Um, we're coming here to my favorite question that I ask every time I uh, open these books, who's telling these stories and how are they telling them? In a Scott Square, we really have three voices or three categories of voices. We have, we have the narrator, we have the focalization through Chris or Ewan, and then we have the communal voice. And the way those interact, especially the narrator and the other voices is quite interesting and does um, frame the way we see the story and the history presented. So for um, each of the novels in the trilogy, we start with a prologue that basically takes the setting that we will then see in the novel and situates it in history. The, the prologue or prelude as they're sometimes called, it um, changes from book to book what this first chapter is called. So I'm just gonna stick to prologue. Um, is not told by a character of the book. It's this narrator's voice. And what the narrator does is give us an in into this place. What is this place and what does it did it look like over the centuries? I have a quote here that's from the prologue to Sunset Song that I'm gonna read out and then I'm gonna draw your attention to a couple of things that um, the narrator's voice highlights. So what we're talking here is um, talking about here is the village of Kenready in which the first book in a Scott Square is set. Um, the quote says, and when the first reformation came and others came after it and folk cried Wigham and some cried Rome and some cried the king, the king ready set them quiet and decent and peaceable in their castle. And he did never affect the arguings of folk for wars were unchancy things. But then Dutch William came, fair plain a fixture that none would move. And the Kinreddies were all for the covenant then. They had a had God's covenant at heart, they said. So they builded a new kirk down where the chapel had stood and builded a men's by it. There in the hill of the use where the Catherine Wallace had hid when the English put him to rout at last. So what we have here is a narrator that quite clearly tells a story and tells the story in such a way that the reader who knows Scottish history has names and places to grab onto and to realize, oh, this is where we are in this story that I know. So we have Dutch William, William, William of Orange. We have the Covenant. We have recognizable or a recognizable part of Scottish history. And then we get this particular village or the main family of this village in this case, situated in this history. And we get the story of what happened here in this fictitious place during this time. And the prologue does this with a lot of Scottish history. So we get a very brief jaunt through Scottish history centered on this village enough so we know how the village fits into 
the broader Scottish history, for us to be situated within it. And then towards the end of the prologue, we get an introduction of the different families living in the village at the time the novel is actually set. So we go from the past right up until the present of the, the novel, situating where we are. And we do this especially for the first two. And then for the third novel, Grey Granite, we don't get this anymore. We are now in a big city, Dunkern, and what becomes clear all throughout the novel is that the people living in the city have forgotten their history. They don't care. They have work to do. They don't care. They're um, unemployed and have to figure out where their next meal comes from. But the history doesn't play a role here anymore. And that is reflected right back to us in the missing prologue that we have gotten used to settling us into a wider Scottish history, here with without. And in the first two books, we get this, this long perspective before we go deep into one point of view and one woman's life. So that's the narrator's voice that sets us up, that gives us some context. And then the main chapters of the novels are mostly very deep into Chris's point of view, um, which is the next um, quote I have for you. We have um, mostly third person narration here, but we do have some second person narration within the narrative. So I've chosen a quote that shows how the switch happens. But really, it also shows how deep in Chris's point of view we are throughout. Um, and the quote reads, just as the last time she climbed to the loch, and when had that been? She opened her eyes and thought, and tired from that, and closed down her eyes again and gave a queer laugh. The June of last year it had been, the day when mother had poisoned herself and the twins. So long as that, and so near as that, you thought of the hours and days as a dark, cold pit you'd never escape. But you'd escaped. The black damp went out of the sunshine and the world went on. The white faces and whispering ceased from the pit. You'd never be the same again, but the world went on and you went with it. So what we have here is um, a very, very close connection to Chris and her emotions, to her story as she tells it. But we also again have an aspect of, of looking back. And this is taken from the very beginning of a chapter. And every chapter in um, the novel is structured the same way. We have Chris in a point, at a point of rest, away from her daily life, looking back. Just as she is in this moment, she's contemplative. She's thinking, when, when was, was I here last? And then we get everything that happened to her in this period since she's been here in this moment of quiet last. So just as the novel as a whole is framed by the historical dimension, Chris's life herself is also, even though it feels immediate, told in flashbacks because we see her in real story time at these moments of rest and then she looks back and then she tells the story or we go back with her through what she has lived through since she last had this moment of peace. So in a way there is also a, um, a reflective quality but at the same time while we are in these I hesitate to term them flashback sections but in the main parts of these chapters we always feel like we are in the moment with her. So what we get in the prologues, all of this extra information, or at least these names that when you know, you can grab onto and know where you are, we don't get that in the main text. So this is not a novel that gives you context for what is happening. The reader knows what Chris knows. And sure, we will, 
know a little more. When we get to 1914 and everyone thinks, oh, well, you know, the war will just be a walk in the park. It'll be over in two weeks. The reader, today's reader, of course, knows that's not the case. But the text doesn't let us know that. While we are in the text, we're right there with Chris thinking, oh, well, how bad can it be? How long can it really take? So we are very, very close here, which is what I wanted to show. And then we have the the communal voice. Um, the communal voice is a little more difficult to grasp because it changes so much. The quote I've chosen to kind of show what it is and what it does is from um, Cloud Howe. I'm going to read it out and then I'm going to discuss how the voice changes over time a little more. But in Cloud How we still have a very, um, very firm communal voice. Um, so it says, a folk listened and thought the man a fair scanner. Damned, you wanted a minister with spunk. Whatever had come over this child called Cahoon, bleeding there soft as a new lipped sheep. Once he glowered as though he would like to gut you and thundered his politics and you'd felt kitted up, though you didn't believe a word that he'd said. But, but this Sunday he blathered away in the clouds. Folk came out and went home and were real disappointed, minding the time when he'd said from the pulpit right out that Harry Hogg was a monkey. Damned, he'd fair fallen away since then. So you get this kind of gossipy character how the people come out from church and they're so disappointed because the sermon wasn't quite up to standards because the sermon didn't make them outraged or angry at the things um, the minister had said or the minister didn't poke fun at members of the congregation. It's um, this kind of not necessarily mean spirited, spirited but gossipy kind of talk you get in a community. In um, in Sunset Song, the voice is a little more mild mannered. It's gossipy, sure, but it's um, not as mean as it becomes in Cloud How. And then in Grey Granite, it splinters. In Grey Granite, what we get is not one communal voice, but we get several voices commenting on what's happening in the story. So you get a minister in Dunkerin, you get um, a newspaper reporter, you get what the newspaper said, you get um, the minister's housekeeper in contrast to the minister him, himself, and then you get a very communal voice for the, the big block of the unemployed that in um, Grey Granite takes center stage as the group that um, is in a way the only true community left when everyone else and every community other than them has kind of splintered and well we are so busy and we have this work and we can't be bothered with anything or with being together and keeping our community alive. So um, the the coldness and unfeelingness of the community surrounding Chris increases over the three novels as she moves. And um, the moves she makes is she starts out in a small village, she, she then moves to a small town, and she ends up in the big city. And as she moves into bigger places, the community kind of breaks down more and more. In Kinready, you have one community, the farmer's community, that is then um, kind of set at odds with, with each other during the war. In Cloud Howe, you have two distinct communities. You have the old Saget town community, and you have the spinners that are disliked by the real people of Saget and aren't allowed to be part of this community. And then in Grey Granite, you have five, six different communities or everyone for himself and the communities of the the workmen, the unemployed who who try to still to still be there for each other, but are in dire circumstances and 
um, have a hard time even if they stick together. So we have um, this element as a way of commenting on Chris's story and in a way giving in more perspectives to the story, but it's also not a voice that is in any way, shape or form knowledgeable or providing background. And putting it like that might seem weird, but when we get to end the land lay still, it'll become very obvious why I'm stressing it here that we do not do not get context. So we are in this story and we know as much as the characters do. We only see the characters' perspectives on the events. We do not get, oh, and by the way, this is what the politicians thought. Again, sounds weird right now, will make sense in, I don't know, four or five slides. So um, these are the narrative voices we have in a Scott Square. And taken together, what we have here is a trilogy that presents the lives of very ordinary Scots. There is no one here among the cast of characters that is in any way, shape or form powerful politically or has more knowledge than the average workman or farmer has in this society at the beginning of the 20th century. Within the trilogy, we touch upon three very important topics to Scottish history. We have Sunset Song focused very much on agriculture and the agricultural year and life on a small croft in Scotland. Book two focuses a lot on religion with Chris being married to a minister and that minister's fight or attempt at a fight for better rights for the workers being the center of the novel. And then the third novel focuses a lot on the unemployment of the working class, on them trying to fight for their rights, but on some of them seeing no other way apart from emigration to get out of the situation and actually find work and find a basis on which to live. We have three main historical events that form the centers of these um, novels. That's World War II and Sunset Song, which completely changes the way agriculture and kin ready happens and um, kind of provides the death knell to this way of life, this small crafting way of life in the novel. Then we have um, the generous strike in Cloud Howe, which um, Chris's husband, the minister, is involved in. And a book three, Great Granite, ends with the with one of the big hunger marches at, that were happening at the beginning of the 1930s. So those are the three most prominent um, historical events that are presented in the novel or in the trilogy. And what we always get is a very close inside perspective of one woman and her surroundings in one town. So um, when we talk about the general strike in the second book of the trilogy, the book does not show how vast the strike was. It very much focuses on this one place and what the people in this one place experienced. It, If you don't know that it was happening all over the UK, you wouldn't know from the novel. So we have this very, very close focus. Um, as I said, there's no additional background information. And wider implications aren't really discussed. So we see the impact on the lives of the people we follow, but that's it. So we have a close focus on what these working class characters were going through in the 1910s to, to the beginning 1930s. That's what the novel offers. And now for a complete shift, we go to End the Land Lay Still, which has been accused of being 
a novel that swallowed a history textbook, which is where all of this additional information is going to come back in. Because what we have in End the Line Play still is a lot of character stories. And then we have a narrator that comes in periodically to give more information, to tell us what's happening on a political level, to introduce events to us, to maybe talk about um, connections, consequences, to give us an idea of what the general mood in Scotland was. And this quote I've chosen here is one that shows how this is done. So um, we're in a chapter regarding the 1980s, and now we're talking about the poll tax. And instead of just having a character who experiences the poll tax and what he experiences, we first get an introduction. And this introduction is only a very small part of the background information that the book provides on the poll tax. Um, I'm going to read out the quote. So you see what I mean. Um, it says, the poll tax or community charge, as it was officially known, was born of the Scottish rights revaluation of the early 1980s. When property owners saw what their new bills were likely to be, they howled and the Scottish Tories, anxious to appease their own natural supporters, badgered the government to come up with something, anything, with which to replace the rates. It happened that a group of radical right-wing intellectuals who had first coalesced around the University of St. Andrews and later developed their ideas in think tanks named after luminaries of the Scottish Enlightenment had a solution. They had dreamed up a scheme whereby almost every adult, regardless of circumstances, would pay the same amount for local services. A levy per head of population or poll tax. This was an offering of such pure simplicity that nobody bothered to consider whether it would actually work. It was seized upon as the answer to the Scottish rights crisis. Margaret Thatcher and others in her government enthusiastically endorsed it and decided it could be implemented in England and Wales too. So what we get here is not a very textbook voice, but a lot of, I'd say, textbook adjacent information. So for anyone reading this book who doesn't know what the poll tax was or where it came from, we have a snarky narrator telling us how it came about. Um, all of these narrator inserts are clearly left leaning. So the book in the form of the narrator does also embody a political stance, I would say, but they also manage to, for a reader who isn't familiar, to give them enough information to not be left out of the story. Um, for someone like me, for example, the first time I ever encountered this text, I didn't know about all of the events it talked about, but I never had the feeling that I was missing out because the text provided me this information. So probably also a Scott that say is in their mid twenties now reading this book, wouldn't have information on all of the things that it talks about, but they would get it through the narrator. Some reviews have seen this as a negative side. I'm just gonna leave it here as this is what happens. We get a lot of background information helping us situate, but this information is not objective, but it has a very clear stance. And it's also mostly poking fun at ideas and concepts and um, positions that it doesn't agree with. So we don't have an objective source of information in the narrator. The narrator has a very clear stance and agenda also. Um, then we have the characters themselves and the way they experience events. I have a quote from that for that too. This is um, about the miners' strike and how it's shown from Mike's perspective. Um, 
The miners' strike kicked off in Scotland, a fact sometimes forgotten. The coal board wanted to close Polmay's colliery as uneconomic, and the Scottish miners came out against it. And then at the same time, the Yorkshire miners came out over proposed closures in their area, and it spread from these two locations. There was never any question whose side Adam and Mike were on. You were either for the miners or for the Tories, and that was it. And if you were for the miners, then you believed in the rightness of the struggle and that victory was possible. And if you ho couldn't wholly subscribe to those articles of faith, as Mike couldn't, you tried your best not to let it show. So what we can see here right away is we're not as close to Mike as we are to Chris in a Scott Square. We are still looking through his eyes and we see what he thinks, but we're not as close to him as close to what he feels. In other parts of the book, we get closer, but we're always a little further away, a little removed. So we are watching from the outside. We're not experiencing things alongside him, which makes the changes to the narrator's voice less jarring, because in this quote too, you can see the move from the narrator's voice into Mike's perspective. So we don't have quite as close a perspective. And then the last type of um, focalization or of um, perspective we have here is um, before each of the big parts of the novel that tell the character stories and that have this um, additional information, we have italicized texts. And these texts we learn over the course of the novel um, are told from a character's perspective in a way, but it's also a very unique perspective. So I have a last quote for that. And that is, um, sometimes it felt like walking, sometimes it felt like flying, or it felt like floating or drifting or like nothing at all, no motion. Just there you were, in, on, and there it was, below, around. A splash of land on the ocean, a splatter of stone, soil, grass, forest, road, town, city, and broken off bits scattered across the great wet belly of the world. And over it splashed lochs and rivers and burns, so much cold, clear water, you'd think the land would drown in it. But it didn't. It laid there, there still breathing, sodden and bogged down in parts, rock hard and ragged in others, but still breathing. And I think I'm going to stop here and not read the rest of it. So this is the very beginning of the novel. So we have a voice that almost at the beginning seems like it may be the Earth or it may be a bodiless entity. Um, as these parts go on, we are more firmly rooted in a human, a person's point of view. But for a long time, it re remains unsure why um, these, where these thoughts are coming from and what these parts are. So um, even when we, when we then piece together through the rest of the story who this character is, um, it feels like here we get um, a less personalized perspective and a more, we're all just, tiny when considering the vastness of the world of history of Scotland. Um, that's the perspective that this starts with and that it also ends on. So we have nitty gritty details and historical events discussed in political um, depth. And then we have this more laid back perspective that basically says, well, we're just here on the surface and once we're gone, no one cares or it will be like we were never there. And that's um, another perspective to add into the mix. And then the, the last part of this story structure of And the Land Lay Still um, comes back to the question of history and history writing and um, crafting narratives because um, the novel itself also 
always ask what it itself is doing. So, um, and the Lende still has a framing narrative in which Mike, whom we've met, is looking through his late father's photographs. His father was a very famous photograph in Scotland, trying to curate an exhibition of his work. So he takes pictures that were taken as snapshots, as um, discrete moments, and tries to build a narrative out of them. And then we have this novel, And the Land Lay Still, that, as I told you, tells the stories of a lot of different characters, weaving them in and out. And we have moments of different characters' lives that together form a narrative. So basically what we have is Mike, in putting together this exhibition, is doing something kind of like the novel does itself, putting stories, pictures next to each other and letting them form a greater whole side by side. And Mike also reflects on this process and the novel ends with the exhibition opening and, and him holding a speech on this topic. And I've taken some of the speech here, it's a lot longer and he has various moments when he um, talks about exactly this, but um, this to me reads as if on the one hand we have Mike talking about the exhibition, but on the other hand it could also be taken as how to read this novel as a whole. So what he says in his... Excuse me, Erika, instead yeah. of reading through the quotes, would you be able to go toward the conclusion as we only have 15 more minutes for oh, Q&A? Sorry, sorry, I didn't realize. I have like two more slides. So um, briefly, um, yeah, what, what we see here is um, the novel itself also grapples with the question of um, how is history told? What, what do we do in... Um, uh, forming this, these narratives. So what we get in uh, overall is we have uh, snapshots of life in Scotland. We get a lot of perspectives. We get a lot of background information. And then we're left with this, with this um, speech, which basically says, trust the story. Whatever it's telling you, it's there. Even if someone else doesn't see it, trust the story. Um, so here we have, on the one hand, um, the aspect of we are presenting all of this and we are presenting it with a clear slant, but we're also saying um, whatever you get from it, or the novel seems to be saying whatever you get from it is valid. Um, yeah, I think that is my my last and concluding statement on And the Land Lay Still. So, um, what we get with all, both of these novels is two very different um, standpoints on presenting Scottish history. Where I end up on the question I asked at the beginning, does Scottish identity change is yes, but not very much. The core that is presented as Scotland, as what Scottish life is like, is the same over both texts pretty much. But what we see in terms of um, where the texts situate Scotland and their characters in terms of a wider um, history that um, a Scot Square very much is concerned with events that were relevant outside of Scotland too. And, and the land lay still is um, more focused on, on the Scottish dimension, on Scottish events, on events that didn't have the same resonance or the same impact outside of Scotland. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really sorry for, for taking so long with this. Um, this is a very brief look at my sources. And then um, thank you very much for listening to me, even if it did take forever. <laughs>